My name is Eric Croft and we're about to embark on a wonderful tour of the waterfront of Lunenburg, uh, learning about the Blue Nose. Behind us we have a beautiful body of water. Off to my right we have a point of land that has a lighthouse on it pr present day. Beyond that we have Lunenburg Bay and about eight miles out across the bay is Cross Island and that protects this harbor from any major storms. Very enticing, very inviting. The first people that came through here were the Mi'kmaq. The Mi'kmaq are a very migratory people. In the winter months they would be uh, inland in the forests of Nova Scotia, protected from the snow, the winds, the cold. Uh, their diet would consist of perhaps, well, meat, uh, bear, moose, deer. But in the spring and summer, when the weather warmed, they would come here to the shoreline using the local lakes, streams, rivers, and live here in the summer. The diet would now consist of shellfish, shorefish, uh, berries in season, and of course meat, rabbits. They were the first people to come through. We also had Acadians here. They fished the sea and more importantly they farmed the land. And the British brought what we call the foreign Protestants around that point and settled the town of Lunenburg. When we talk about the Blue Nose, I always think of the people that lived here. The Mi'kmaq, they were with one with the land, they respected it. Uh, I think of the Acadians, they harnessed the land, they harvested from the land and the sea. And I also think of the foreign Protestants. They were faced with challenges when they came ashore here in 1753 and they met those challenges. And that's what created the Blue Nose. When you think of the Blue Nose ship, you think of the Blue Nose town. They are one, they are the same. The Blue Nose. Blue Nose 2 was built in 1963 in the sheds just behind me. When you think of the Blue Nose, you think of a fast racing vessel. That's true, the Blue Nose raced, but she also fished. And we're gonna learn about that on this tour. You're gonna to learn about her fishing years at the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic. You're gonna learn about her racing years at the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic. You're also gonna learn about her afterlife at the museum. I'm gonna talk you through how this all came to be. When she was launched, she looked like a typical vessel, 143 feet in length, 26 feet beam, 16 foot draft. She carried 10,000 square feet of canvas in her sails. Her boom was 81 feet long, a typical vessel of the time. But remember those people, the Mi'kmaq, the Acadians, the foreign Protestants, they had a, an interest in what was happening in the harbor. This was a Blue Nose ship. This was a Lunenburg ship. In fact, the shipyards are still active today. You can hear the noise behind me. What appears to be a typical grocery store in Lunenburg would have been an outfitter. Uh, let's go back to the turn of the previous century when there were upwards of 200 schooners here in the harbor. These men were fishing. A typical codfish trip was almost two months in length. The men had to eat. No refrigeration, so the menu of those men reflected that. A lot of uh, root crops, potatoes, turnips, parsnips, beets, throw in a few cabbage, 
pickled food, sauerkraut, a wonderful uh, local delicacy, dried meats, pudding and sausage, again a local delicacy, and of course water, flour and sugar, uh, everything that the cook needed to make his wonderful bread and cookies. That's what they would buy here from the store uh, for the ship. The men themselves, uh, the dories that they were fishing from were owned by the fishing company, but everything in that dory was owned by the fisherman. So he had to supply himself with oil gear, sou'westers, mittens, and so on. His wife, while the fisherman was out at sea, was coming down to the grocery store, the company store, to purchase daily groceries, school supplies for the kids. So this was a very, very busy uh, place in the town. The Blue Nose and Lundeberg schooners brought their codfish back into port wet. While they were at sea catching the fish, they removed the head, removed the backbone, washed it, put it in the hold, layer of salt, layer of fish, layer of salt, so on. At the end of the trip, they brought those loaded vessels back here into Lunenburg Harbor. And that's when it really became intensive. That codfish had to be processed. It came ashore in its wet state, they scrubbed off the salt, and then all along the coastline here, they built stages, perhaps three, four feet high, covered them with spruce boughs, and then placed the wet codfish on it to dry. On a day like today, they had to cover it. Uh, a sun like this would bake, bake it and spoil it. Uh, a rainy day, a wet day, a foggy day, it had to be covered so it wouldn't rot. Every sixth or seventh day, every week, they would pile it into a pyramid, and the juice of the fish onto itself would help in the drying process. That took anywhere from six to seven weeks. That's when the fisherman was paid. Uh, all of the meals that he ate came out of his paycheck. All of the groceries that his wife shopped for at the uh, outfitting store were deducted. All of his fishing gear that he lost or had to be, be, be repaired uh, were deducted, and then he was paid. And if you look across the harbor here, right from Callback Head, along the shoreline where the golf course is today, into the tan yard, sweeping around the inner harbor, beneath us here, onto garden lots where we started, and off to Blue Rocks. This whole shoreline was either a fish flake or a wharf to accommodate those schooners. In the 1920s, 1930s, during the time of the Great Depression, you also had prohibition. You had schooners here in the harbor that weren't working. You had men that weren't fishing. You had families that weren't eating. What Lunaburgers did, what those crafty foreign Protestants did, they took those schooners and went down south or to St. Pierre Miquelon off of Newfoundland, a French territory, loaded them up with liquor, then took them down along the eastern seaboard during the rum running period. Um, as this took hold, the schooners were thought to be oh, a little bit slow. So the shipyards were ramped up again and the men were building faster vessels. They built them short. They built them uh, that they laid low in the water. They would paint them gray uh, so that they blended in with the fog. Uh, they had all kinds of tricks. Lunenburgers were very crafty people. Uh, they would name their ships weird names like Matathalapadu, thinking if you can't spell it, you can't record it, just let it float by. Uh, the Coast Guard would move in, take a note of their name then move off chasing another vessel. In the meantime, that first vessel had a nameplate they threw down over the original. So when the Coast Guard moved in again, they saw a totally different ship. Keep the Coast Guard confused. And my favorite trick of all time was bottle fishing. They got spotted by the Coast Guard and they didn't want to get caught. They didn't want to lose their cargo. So what they would do was they'd throw all the bottles overboard. Before they did that, they took note of where they were doing it and they tied bags of salt 
to the bottles of booze. Coast Guard moved in, couldn't find anything. Then the rum runner swung around, came to that very same spot and retrieved the bottles. As the salt dissolved, the bottles rose and there you go, bottle fishing. At one time, Lunenburg boasted seven blacksmith shops. Imagine these vessels. In the early years, they sailed. In later years, uh, to compete with other rum runners, to compete with trawlers, they installed engines. There was a lot of ironwork that was involved uh, in outfitting these vessels. The original Blue Nose was outfitted here at Thomas & Son Blacksmith Shop. It's a three-generation uh, shop. They have outfitted over 400 vessels uh, from Lunenburg Port. The HMS Bounty was built here in Lunenburg for MGM. It took nine and a half ton of ironwork to outfit that ship. It was done here. The Blue Nose, HMS Rose was outfitted here. And present day, tall ships come into Lunenburg because they know that we have the wherewithal, we, they know that we have the skills. Present day, Thomas & Son Blacksmith Shop is operating as a distillery. Dories were the workhorses here in Lunenburg. Each schooner carried upwards of 12 dories, two men to a dory. The schooners would go to the Grand Banks off of Newfoundland, be placed at anchor, then two men in that dory would row anywhere from four to five miles away from the schooner and fish for cod. The dories were the workhorses. Adams and Knickel would be another outfitting company here in Lunenburg. They're presently operating to this day. They're involved in the uh, scallop fishing industry. Uh, if you go into a restaurant, uh, present day, uh, more often than not, those scallops are A and K, Adams and Knickel. If you look at the building, uh, you will see that it's a dark, deep red. When the schooners were fishing for cod, they cut out the cod livers and made cod liver oil right on the deck. They brought that liver home, they brought that oil home, and it was graded. Uh, the higher grades went for human consumption. The lower grades, perhaps it was rancid, perhaps there were things floating in it. Uh, you mixed it with ochre from the soil and created the nice, dark, deep red stain for your uh, workshops. And as we walk through the town, you are going to see quite a few of the warehouses along the waterfront are that dark, deep red. And if you look at the windows uh, on street level, you'll see that they're open. Look directly above those windows on the second floor, and you'll see that there's a shutter across it. These are drop shutters. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, those shutters are pushed down, and you have a closed window on the first floor and an open window on the second. Rather unique for Lunenburg. Fishing is considered to be the most dangerous occupation in the world. More dangerous even than soldiering, farming, and mining. In 1926 and 1927, Lunenburg lost six ships and over a hundred men schooning off the waters of Sable Island. These were, by and large, sailing vessels. So they would bring the uh, ships as close to Sable Island as possible because cod fish like a gravelly, shallow bottom. Bring your boats, bring your dories in and fish, which was wonderful. The only problem with Sable is that storms come up quite quickly, quite violently, 
And again, we lost 100 men in just those two years. This is our memorial. The outside pillars list all the men that have been lost fishing over the years. So it hasn't just been 1926, 1927. This is a dangerous occupation, period. There's one blank pillar, and that's the pillar facing south. And that is in tribute to the men that still fish. The inside pillar uh, lists the schooners that went down. And yes, indeed, the Blue Nose was involved in the August Gales. She was lucky. Uh, there's an incredible story about her sailing across the bar during the gales. These dories were again four or five miles away from the schooner. You had the danger of Sable Island. You had transport ships coming from Europe, uh, moving right through the fishing lanes. Uh, you had snow squalls that would come up. A dory is a flat bottom boat. The more weight you put in it, the sturdier she gets. But unfortunately, the lower she goes in the water. And this was the risk that the fishermen took. They wouldn't row back and forth all day long with a little bit of fish. They would uh, take their chances, load up as much as possible. Again, those rogue waves, snow squalls might come up and take them down. Lunenburgers, again, we know how to think. We invented the life jacket. Uh, a dory is a flat bottom boat. And as they're moving to and from the banks, uh, they're stacked one inside each other. And to keep them dry from waves, from rain, from snow, they used to drill a hole in the stern. All the waves and rain and water would wash down through the dories to keep them dry. When they go fishing, the first thing they do is put a plug in that hole. And this was their life jacket. Imagine that dory being flat bottomed. There's no way you can hold on to it. Again, these men never learned how to swim. Um, it was just impossible to grasp onto that, onto that wet, flat dory bottom. So what Lundbergers did, they tied a loop in the plug. So when the dory's in the water, the plug is out of the way, nobody's business. When the dory turns upside down, all of a sudden you have a loop. And one fisherman would come along and put the loop up over his shoulder. Now he's physically attached to the dory, and that gives him two arms, two hands to grab onto his dory mate. And then he prays. This was and still is a very dangerous occupation. Visitation to the Tressie Connor and the Fisheries Museum of the Atlantic is included in the Blue Nose 100 tour. Happy birthday, Blue Nose! Mm -hmm.